Hi, this is Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Thursday, April 4th, 2013. Hope you guys are having a great day today. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy and end time events. So with that in mind, let's have a look at what's going on. This first story out of Arut Sheva says North Korea approaches merciless military strikes against the United States. This thing with North Korea continues. The North Korean army said today it had final approval to launch merciless military strikes on the United States involving the use of cutting-edge nuclear weapons. There it is. Right there, big and strong. In a statement published by the official KCNA news agency, the general staff of the Korean People's Army, the KPA, said it was formally informing Washington that reckless U.S. threats would be smashed by cutting-edge, smaller, lighter, and diversified nuclear strike means. The merciless operation of our revolutionary armed forces in this regard has been finally examined and ratified, the statement said. That's not my phone. Sorry. <laughs> North Korea had threatened preemptive uh, nuclear strikes against the United States a month ago, and last week the Supreme Army Command ordered its strategic rocket units to combat status for strikes on the U.S. mainland and American bases in Guam and Hawaii. The moment of explosion <laughs> is approaching fast. Sorry about the phone, guys. Thursday statement said, adding that a war could break out on the Korean Peninsula today or tomorrow. In view of this situation, the KPA general staff in charge of all operations will take powerful, practical military counteractions in succession, it said. And despite a successful long-range rocket launch in December, most experts believe North Korea is years from developing a genuine intercontinental ballistic missile that could strike the mainland United States. Hawaii and Guam would also be outside the range of its medium-range missiles, which would be capable, however, of striking U.S. bases in South Korea and Japan. This story doesn't seem to be going away. It seems to be growing. Here's another story out of Yahoo. The United States to send missile defenses to Guam over North Korea threat. The United States said it would soon send a missile defense system to Guam to defend it from North Korea. The U.S. military adjusts to what Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel called a real and clear danger from, from Pyongyang. Uh, hours later, South Korea's Yonhap News Agency said North Korea had moved what appeared to be a mid-range Masudan missile to its east coast. It wasn't clear if the North planned to fire the rocket or was just putting it up on display as a show of force one South Korean government source was quoted as saying. So they're showing, they're moving this missile. They don't know if it has a nuclear warhead on it or not. They don't know if they plan to fire it or not. But they're moving it to make sure everybody sees it. North Korea also barred entry to a joint industrial complex it shares with the South for a second day today and said it would shut the zone if Seoul continued to insult it. <laughs> continued to insult it little name calling my how feathers get ruffled over a little name calling right anyway so this just kinda makes you wonder what's gonna happen what is gonna come out of this North Korean threat will they try to send a nuke to some US installations nearby will they send a bomb to the South Korean peninsula what what kind of response would the United States or South Korea and the United States do in return? And then if the United States responds, what's China going to respond with? Things that make you go, hmm. And please, guys, understand this. Again, I, I don't bring you this news to scare you because those who are truly grounded in Christ aren't afraid of what this world can do to us. I bring you this news to inform you of what's going on and to try to give everybody an idea of how close we are to so many prophecies in the Bible coming true. And the closer we get to these happening, the closer we get to the return of Jesus Christ. We need to watch like Jesus said. We need to pray like Jesus said. Ah, Let's see what else we have. Here's something out of Yahoo. Iran's Jalili vows stronger defense of nuclear policy. You know, tomorrow they're going to this uh, nuclear talks, another round. 
I don't know why they keep doing these every couple of months and nothing ever gets resolved and then they go, oh, well, we'll talk about it in a couple more months, just buying Iran more time to keep marching toward a nuclear weapon. This story says Iran's chief negotiator, uh, nuclear negotiator, Saeed Jalili, sounded a defiant note ahead of a new round of talks with world powers in Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan saying today they had to recognize Iran's right to enrich uranium to see any breakthrough. Okay, the six powers, United States, France, China, uh, Russia, Britain, and Germany, will meet tomorrow and Saturday, hoping Tehran agrees to scale back its most sensitive atomic work that they suspect is aimed at achieving a nuclear weapons capability. Iran wants the right to enrich uranium. These other six say, uh, no, we want you to stop. So I see another impasse coming and another two-month delay allowing Iran to continue doing what they're doing, marching toward a nuclear weapon, so they can wipe Israel off the face of the earth and usher in their 12th Imam, their Mahdi. You know, if you ever done any extensive research on this 12th Imam, this Mahdi, Google Twelvers and see what these people believe. This is the one they believe in the ninth century disappeared in a well and that he's going to emerge very soon, but they have to create global chaos in order to do so. And it's funny that Jesus said if they say he's out in the desert, if they say Christ is out in the desert, don't believe it. If they say he's in the secret chamber, don't believe it. And here's this Mahdi supposed to come out of a secret chamber in the desert. Very interesting. Also this 12th Imam, if you read what he does and descriptions of him and who he is and then you compare him in the Holy Bible to who the Antichrist is and what he's supposed to do they match almost perfectly so the one you're gonna have this one group of Muslims following this person claiming he's the Messiah the Christ when he's actually the Antichrist there's gonna be so many people deceived following after the wrong one the Bible is very clear when Christ returns everyone will know it every head will bow. Every creature on the face of the earth will tremble at his presence. Jesus doesn't have to say, ah, uh, it's me, hello. You'll know in your heart. You'll know. You'll fear and tremble. People that don't know him before he returns will crawl into caves and pray for the rocks to cave in on them and fall in on them, the Bible says. The true Christ won't have to announce who he is. Only a false one will. Keep that in mind. Here's a story out of Yahoo. Insight. Syrian government guerrilla fighters being sent to Iran for training. This out of Syria, Homs province, the Syrian government is sending members of its irregular militias for guerrilla combat training at a secret base in Iran. In a move to bolster its armed forces drained by two years of fighting and defections, fighters and activists have said. This discreet program has been described as an open secret in some areas loyal to President Bashar Assad, who's trying to crush a revolt against his family's four-decade hold on power. You know, I've been talking about Isaiah 17.1 for some three, four years now. <laughs> and a lot of people give me a hard time. They're like, you know, I remember a couple of years ago when you said it could happen any day now. Well, guess what? It could still happen any day now. You know, like the Bible says, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. Thank God it hasn't happened yet. But know this. It will happen. It will happen. It's in the Word of God. It will come to pass. And I think we're seeing the events that are leading up to it. Moving on, here's a story out of oilprice.com. It says, gas starts flowing from Israel's Levant Basin. Now what? The first gas has started flowing from Israel's supergiant Tamar gas field in the Levant Basin. Where it will go will redraw the Mediterranean energy map and the geopolitics that goes along with it. Now, the, the story talks about the fact that Israel will start pumping uh, the gas to the mainland Israel where it will feed the domestic market but exports should begin in only a matter of two to three years. What Israel has in mind, the story says, is the European market. Israel has its eye on the European market? 
Do you know who currently holds the contract for the European market? It's Russia. How do you think Russia will respond when one of its biggest contracts is threatened by Israel? This, this nearly confirms something for me because in Ezekiel 38, uh, I believe it's 38, it talks about the hook in the jaw that will cause them to turn back and attack an unwalled village. I believe this oil and gas is that hook in the jaw that will make Russia and yes even Iran attack Israel because of it. Now maybe that's not the reason they attack but the spoils of war certainly are a big incentive for somebody like that. Remains to be seen. You know this, this is a very exciting time to be alive on the face of the earth if you know Christ. If you don't, it could be a very frightening time to be alive on the face of the earth when you're facing the fact that you might soon stand face to face with your creator and your judge. Even knowing Christ, it's a very daunting reality knowing that pretty soon we'll stand before him and answer to the lives we've lived here be responsible for everything we've ever done or said. Here's a story out of the blaze. Archaeologists uncover a 4,000 year old site in biblical Abraham's hometown of Ur from the time he likely lived there. This is amazing. Out of Baghdad, the British archaeologist uh, says he and his colleagues have unearthed a huge rare complex near the ancient city of Ur in southern Iraq, home of the biblical Abraham. The team first discovered the magnificent find using a satellite. Talks about this goes back about 4,000 years, about the time Abraham would have lived there. It's believed to have been an administrative center for Ur. This is pretty cool. It doesn't give you a lot of details, but um, it, it's about uh, 80 meters on each side wide. It, it says it's a huge complex and one this size and this age are very rare to find. They also have this plaque of a worshiper wearing a flowing robe and approaching a sacred site and they show a picture of this plaque and you look at it and you just wonder is that is that a depiction of Abraham on that stone and it just woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> I love when something confirms the holy word you know I love days that don't have a lot of news going on because then I get to get more into the word but how about a little laugh time first of all Let's talk about some questions of logic. How come a wise man and a wise guy are opposites? Why do overlook and oversee mean opposite things? You ever think about that? If horrific means to make, to make horrible, doesn't terrific mean to make terrible? Our English language is very strange. For instance, how come we have hot water heaters? I mean, isn't that redundant? Wouldn't we need a hot water cooler or a cold water heater just saying I am is the shortest sentence in the English language so how is it then that I do is the longest sentence <laughs> you married guys will get that pretty soon um, <laughs> if lawyers are disbarred and clergymen are defrocked why doesn't it follow that electricians can be delighted musicians denoted cowboys deranged Models deposed, tree surgeons debarked, and dry cleaners depressed. <laughs> Why is it if you tell someone that there's over a billion stars in the universe, they believe it, but if you're told a wall has wet paint on it, you have to touch it to make sure? You've all done that. If people in Poland are called Poles, why aren't people from Holland called Poles? Just curious. You know, being in real estate, it I always find it fascinating to see some of the names of towns. Here's a few things that don't really surprise me. There's a town called Rudeville, New Jersey. There's a Boring, Oregon, a Hell, Michigan, <laughs> Hooker, California, Virgin, Utah, Dulls Corner, Maryland. There's a Bowlegs, Oklahoma. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to be from Bowlegs, Oklahoma? There's a Volcano, Hawaii. 
There's Beersville, Pennsylvania, Fleetown, Ohio, Burnt Corn, Alabama, Two Guns, Arizona, and Toad Suck, Arkansas. Those are actual names of real towns. <laughs> Let's get into the Word of God. First Peter. Let's go to First Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're called to be the light. You ever have these people that ask you, or, or they, I've had people tell me, I'm, I'm called to go into the ministry. You know, I've worked in, in this secular office for 10 years, and the way people act and live is just horrible. If I could just work at a church, they think that would be the perfect environment. They'd never have any temptations. They'd never have any problems. They'd never have any work issues at all. And I've talked to preachers that have home churches. I, I don't have a home church that I preach in on a regular basis. I preach here and there when people ask me to at various functions. Um, but yes, they probably work in a less worldly atmosphere than everyone else, but while their challenges on the job might be different, they still have challenges. I think it's very important that there are Christians in every aspect of life, in every sphere of influence we could possibly have. We need poor Christians as much as we need rich Christians. We need Christian attorneys. We need Christian CEOs. We need Christian businessmen, Christian managers, Christian car salesmen, Christian real estate agents, uh, Christian ditch diggers. Okay? Believers are called to live and work in very tough environments where the temptation to sin is present all the time. But in each and every one of these situations, God gives you strength to deal with sin and to live for Him. The reason God has you where He has you is so you can shine your light for Him in that area of this world. Don't think that just because you are a waitress in a cafe that you can't witness to people. Or just because you work retail at some clothing store that you can't be used by God. Because you can. You can make a difference in your workforce and with your customers. You know, people get in my truck all the time to go look at houses. And they might glance in the back seat and see that I have a stack of Bibles back there. I've had people say, why do you have so many Bibles? That opens it up to all kinds of opportunities for me to be able to witness to them about Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I'll say, well, that one's a King James Bible. I use that one to read about the Word of God. And that one is a study Bible. Helps me to go a little deeper. There's a Strong's Concordance over there. And then that one over there is the New Living Testament, or New Living Translation. And sometimes they ask me, why do you need so many different versions? Well, it's because I like to study the Word. And if I don't understand what a passage says, says in the King James, I can go to one of these other versions and have a look and see if maybe it helps me understand it better. Hmm. So the reason God has you where he has you is so you can shine for him in that area. So you can be a light to the world right where you are. You're exactly where you're supposed to be right now at this point in time. So light the world with your light. Shine it. Don't hide it. Let the world see. You don't light a light and hide it under a bushel basket, the Bible says. You shine it. Let all the world see. That's what you're called to do. Let's talk about the holiness of God. Any of you guys ever have this prayer when you were kids? You know, God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for the food, amen. You ever have that one? I have to admit, I said that a few times when I was a kid. I, I heard my grandmother say it one time. Of course, being from Texas, she kind of pronounced food as if it rhymed with good. And it almost did rhyme when she said it. I never got it to quite rhyme like she did. But there's two virtues assigned to God in this prayer, this simple prayer. Greatness and goodness. And it could be captured by one biblical word, and that's holy. When we talk about the holiness of God, we're, we're accustomed to associating it almost exclusively with the, the, the purity and the, the righteousness of God. And yes, those ideas of holiness contain these virtues, but they're not the primary meaning of holiness, I don't think. The biblical word holy has two distinct meanings. The primary meaning is apartness or 
otherness. I mean, when we say God is holy, we call attention to the profound difference between Him and all of His creation. Only God is holy. We're certainly not. It refers to God's transcendent majesty, His supreme authority, um, by virtue of which He's worthy of our honor, our, our reverence, our adoration, our worship, our praise, our respect. And yes, the Bible even says fear. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, it's not like we're to cower and expect He's going to take us out at any time. But we're to revere Him for the Creator He is. Yes, He did create us. And yes, He could take us out any time He chose. But when the Bible speaks of holy objects or holy people or holy time, it talks about things that have been set apart or, or consecrated or made different by the touch of God himself. The ground where Moses stood, where, where the burning bush was, was holy because God was present there in a very special way. He said, take off your shoes. The ground you're walking on is holy ground. Don't you think if you could find that very spot where that bush was burning, that ground probably has some different aspect to it even today? Don't you think it probably still maybe shines like a polished marble finish or something? I, I still think that. Even the spot where Moses got the Ten Commandments on, on Mount Sinai, I bet there's a spot that just looks different from everything else, that the presence of God was just touching that mountain. I think that, but, you know. The other meaning of holy refers to God's pure and righteous actions. I mean, God does what's right. He's pure, he's holy, he never does what's wrong. God always acts in a righteous manner because his nature is holy. You know, Jesus said, be ye perfect as your Father is perfect. So we can extinguish between, did I say extinguish? <laughs> I meant to say distinguish. Uh, between the internal righteousness of God, his holy nature, and the external righteousness of God, his actions. And because God is holy, he's both great and good. So there's no evil mixed in with his goodness. And when we're called to be holy, it doesn't mean that we, we share in God's divine majesty that could never be in this flesh, but that we're to be different from our normal, fallen, sinful selves. We're called to mirror and reflect the moral character and the activity of God. We're to imitate his goodness. We're to be like him. Remember, the Bible says when we see Christ, we're going to see him as he is, and we're going to be just like him. Because it's going to be our spirit, our, our, our perfect, unblemished, sinless spirit that's going to be raised just the same way Christ was. Acts 17, 21 says, For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. There's a great temptation to forget the few spiritual essentials and to go wandering off after some unimportant thing. This seems to be very strong appeal to a lot of people, especially those who call themselves Christians, that have this, you know, such a curious type of mind. These people find the great majors of our faith and of our fathers altogether too tame for them, let's say. It's not exciting enough. You know, their souls crave more than what they get out of the gospel. And they'll take a verse and they'll twist it to mean something completely different from what it truly means. Do you know these kind of people? They'll say, oh, God revealed something to me. And they'll say it in such a way that only they are privy to this new revelation. You ever have these people call you and talk to you about something like that and you're like okay what is it and they'll tell you something and you're like that's not what that verse says to me um, interesting that you found it to mean that for you but I think we need to stay true to the Word of God and I know it's it's difficult sometimes for us to rightly divide the word that's why we're together here, though, to help each other grow. I have to say I saw a conversation today that just 
made me so happy. Somebody was saying something that went against the Word of God, and several people mentioned something in a kind and gentle way. And the person came back and said, I understand now that what I said was wrong, thank you. And I was like, yes! That's what it's all about! That's how we sharpen each other. That's how we grow in our faith. That's how we help each other, how we encourage each other. Somebody was on the wrong road of a doctrine that's not in the Word of God. And several people pointed it out, and he said, mm, forgive me, I was wrong. And I was like, yes, that's what we need more of. We need more of that, definitely. Ah, let's see, okay, it's April. Yes, I think I got a few of you guys on April Fool's Day when I came out with a, a little goof of my own. Um, let's talk about that. I, I want to I talk about that. You know, Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They're corrupt. They have done abominable things or works. There is none that doeth good. Proverbs 26, verse 11 um, says, As a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. Like I said, just a few days ago, we had April Fool's Day. <sighs> Let's talk about what the Bible calls a fool. We all know somebody, right? You probably know a fool like Frank. You know, Frank will brag one day about having the most latest expensive gadget that he purchased, and the next day the, he explains the, the power company cut off his electricity because he couldn't pay his bill. You know, and you're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Go spend on some crazy item, and then you can't pay your electric bill. Or he comes to work with a hangover, but it's only Tuesday, and you're like, dude, really? Okay. And according to the Bible, Frank shows all classic symptoms of being a fool, right? Proverbs 20, verse 3 says, fools are quick to argue. I've seen Frank argue with a man until the man says, okay, I give up, you win. We can stop talking about it. But Frank wants to continue talking about why he's right. Rub it in your face, right? Another trait of a fool is a strong belief that he's always right. Anybody know people like that? Always right. I've had so many people, so many people, and what kills me is some claiming to be Christian, telling me things that I know clearly go against the Word of God. And I say, no, that's not what the Bible says. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, you must be a son of Satan. You must be a Kenite or, or a son of Cain or, you know, and start with a name calling. It's like, really? Because I'm showing you that the Bible is disagreeing with your comment. You're going to say, I'm wrong? Because it's not my word that says it. It's God's word. Why don't you take it up with him? You ever have these people argue with you that they're right? Bible must be wrong. <laughs> Proverbs 12:15 says the way of a fool seems right to them. Proverbs 14:16 says a fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure. And please, not all of these are King James only verses. I know some of them make more sense out of other versions, just saying. Don't hate on me, you King James only guys. I love you. You know, Frank tells us about his plans to advance his career even though he knew his job had random drug tests and he partied took drugs, did what he needed to do or wanted to do. and Of course, he did not get on that corporate ladder. He was probably eventually fired because he failed a drug test. How do you try to help a fool? You know, correcting them does no good. According to Proverbs, they despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1, verse 7. And speaking to them does no good because they'll scorn you for your prudent words. 23, verse 9. But on the other hand, the Proverbs also tell us, be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools, or they will become wise in their own estimation. Proverbs 26, verse 5, the New Living Translation. Some people like Frank are going to do foolish things. Bailing them out once in a while might earn their gratitude, but only God can truly save a lost soul like a fool. We need to lift them up in prayer and try to gently lead them and let God make the foolish wise. Now I know some of you are going to quote to me Matthew 5.22, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause 
shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Pointing out the fact that the Bible calls someone a fool is not me calling that person a fool. There's a difference. We all know fools, don't we? Let's not hide it under the rug. Let's try to help these fools to come into the light of Christ and out of that darkness they're in and remove the scales from their eyes. Ah, uh, Do you crave an intimacy with God? Read Psalm 63, verse 1 through 11. You know, Christians, I, I think it's fairly simple for us to notice in other people this God-shaped void in their lives that they're trying to fill with all the wrong things, right? You know these people? Uh, but it's much harder to see that very same error in our own lives sometimes. I'm guilty. I, I, I do it sometimes. Don't always realize it. You know, we all too easily get busy for God. You know, oh, let's serve here. Let's sing there. Let's teach. Let's preach. Let's, let's go to the mission field. Let's give money. Let's tithe. Let's give to orphans. None of these are wrong things. You know, they're, they're actually good, but they're often sometimes a, a misguided attempt to create a false intimacy with God. I mean, why would, why would anyone who believes in Christ choose artificial closeness with the Lord when he wants to give his children the real thing? I think there's two reasons. First, being known by God requires some intense vulnerability and the humility to receive his grace. And let's face it, a lot of us don't like to be humble. We like to shout out the name of God, tell the world about Jesus, shout out Jesus from the rooftops. You know, there's nothing we can do for the Lord or, or give to him that will atone for our sins. And second, I think all successful friendships require hard work and effort on both people. And that, that holds true for our relationship with God also. It takes work. It takes an effort. So to really know the Lord, you need to read the Bible. All of it. You know, people say, Oh, God talked to people in the Old Testament and the, some in the New Testament, but He doesn't talk to people today. Yeah, He does. Right here. He talks to us today with His Word that proceeded from the mouth. You know, you, you can't maintain a close relationship with your Heavenly Father if you ignore His principles, His laws. So you need to fill your mind with godly things and not earthly things and forego all the influences of this world. I know it's hard. I, and please believe me, I, I'm not standing up on some pedestal telling everyone down below to do as I do, okay? Because I'm right here with you. I'm nothing but a fallen sinner saved by grace. That, that's all I will ever be. My best five minutes on this planet's not good enough to get me into heaven. Thank God he sent his son Jesus to save us from ourselves, mostly. From ourselves. But... You have to have a vibrant prayer life. It's very essential to have an intimacy with God. And these things don't just happen. They require an intentional effort on your part. You have to want it. When we satisfy our thirst with living water, we're no longer thirsty. When we live in this intimate communion with God, the temptation to strive to be a saint is no longer in our own strength. Okay, it, it's, it's in God's strength. And our, our service, our, our offerings, our worship, our praise, everything we do is stripped away of any self-serving motives. And it's all a genuine effort to glorify God and to make sure that people know Him for who He is and what He did to redeem us so that we can have fellowship with Him. We want peace with God, right? Luke 2, 14 says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace goodwill toward men, right? You hear this every Christmas, probably. In another instance, Jesus said he didn't come to send peace on the earth, but a sword. Then he prophesied that those who received him would experience persecution, even from their own family, in Matthew 10, verse 34 or so. So how do these two verses fit together? The peace the angels were talking about was not a peace between men. They were rejoicing that there would now be peace between God and man. Okay, when, when Jesus prophesied division and war in Matthew 10, he was speaking of relationships between men. 
Okay, so there's a difference. Through the Old Testament law, God began to release his wrath on man's sin. Romans 4, verse 15, it wasn't the wrath of Satan that Jesus suffered on the cross. It was the wrath of God. He suffered the wrath of his Father. Isaiah 53, 10 through 12, and 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The Father put his punishment for our sins all on Jesus on that cross. This ended the war between God and man. This is the peace that the angels were proclaiming. When Jesus died on the cross and it tore the curtain in two in the temple, that's very significant because behind that curtain, and this was no regular cloth curtain, this had actually a metallic fabric to it. It would have been very hard to tear in two for a man to do. First of all, it was like some 30 feet tall for one thing, but that was, that was separating the rest of the world from the very Holy of Holies. It was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And only the high priest could enter into it. And he only did so once a year after a very ritualistic cleansing. The reason that curtain was torn in two was because Jesus Christ provided a way. He removed the curtain that separated us from God. Our sin is what separated us from God. Jesus paid the price. He took care of that. He removed that barrier completely. So now we can have fellowship with God Almighty. We can go directly to God in prayer because of what Christ did for us. That's the peace the angels are talking about. So as a result of man receiving this peace from God, there's also been several cases of reconciliation between man, but that's simply an effect. It's not the actual peace that was spoken of. Those kind of effects are secondary. And today, through Jesus, we now have peace with God. Um, Romans, Romans 5, verse 1. Don't you love Romans? Love my brother Paul. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't get any simpler than that, people. God isn't mad at us. He's not even upset. We've been accepted through Jesus. Look at what, um, where are we? Ephesians. Ephesians 1 verse 6 says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Believe the good news that through Jesus Christ, the war between God and us is over. Okay? But, when Christ comes back, says He'll have a sword that proceeds out of His mouth, and He'll have an army with Him. And he's going to fight against all those who fight against him. Are you fighting against God today? Or are you going to be in his army fighting alongside with him? Think about it. There's only two destinations for every living soul on the face of this earth. Heaven or hell. And the difference is your relationship with Jesus Christ. That makes all the difference in the world. Accept him as Lord, Savior, and King and reign with God forever in heaven or reject him and be banished to hell it's pretty simple people why would you choose eternal damnation over everlasting life makes no sense to me it's a no-brainer choose wisely Christ is the only way to God the Father God bless you guys good Lord willing I'll see you again tomorrow